What's up YouTube, I'm Guy. Today on the channel I'd like to talk Seiko. In particular, I want to reference an article that I read a few weeks ago. That article, which I have uh, bits and pieces of it printed out here in front of me so I can reference the important parts, was entitled, In America, Seiko Wants to Ditch the Discount Brand Image. This was published on Bloomberg.com around December 24th, authored by uh, somebody on their staff named Joe Thompson. So this isn't first and foremost uh, random rumors. This didn't come from some sort of enthusiast blog or uh, another YouTube channel. This came from a legitimate news source, Bloomberg.com. So I think that it's important that we treat it with a little bit of, uh, of credence, I guess is what I would say. This isn't just rumors and hearsay. This is, in fact, gen genuine reporting and journalism. Now that said, I also want to reference a video that I made I don't know, quite a while ago, I don't remember exactly, months and months ago, and I entitled that video, uh, Has Seiko Jumped the Shark? Or Seiko Jumped the Shark? Or something to that effect. So I made that video a while ago because at the time, Seiko had announced some new models, and they were all limited edition models. They were pretty expensive compared to similar offerings that they have put out in the past. And overall, I just didn't like the direction I have been seeing Seiko go over the last year or so. More and more limited edition watches, uh, more and more escalating price points within the Seiko Core and Presage line, but offering less for that new price. That video was um, kind of well received by some and uh, a lot of people really disliked that video because they're big Seiko fanboys. Now don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of Seiko. I have been for a long time. I just don't like the direction that the company has been going over the course of again the last year or so. And I voiced my opinion on that in that video that we're talking about. Now, what's interesting is Months and months later, this article that I have here was written again by Bloomberg. And in that video, it sort of reiterated, or I'm sorry, in that article, it sort of reiterated everything that I was talking about to a certain degree in my original video. So one of the first points that I want to hit on from this article, and I'll quote several things from the article as we go through this video that I want to hit on, goes as such. In a major strategic pivot, Seiko Watch Corporation in Tokyo, successor to K. Hitori and Company, is shifting the focus of its U.S. operations away from affordable Seiko-based watches to Grand Seiko, the company's leading luxury watch brand. Now, in my original video I had mentioned, it felt to me that Seiko was trying to push up market, like it didn't want to be a discount brand. It didn't want to be thought of as the affordable high value brand. That's exactly what this article is saying. Now what they're saying is that they're trying to shift focus away from Core Seiko and towards Grand Seiko. And while certainly that's true, they've said as much. I think that it goes a little bit deeper than that. But I'll talk about that in a few more minutes. I want to hit on a few extra points here. The article eventually goes on to say that this fall, SWC reorganized its U.S. company, creating a new subsidiary called Grand Seiko Corp. of America. And quoting, uh, by establishing this new company, we're committed to changing our business model in this market, that being the United States. This move expresses our focus on the high end of the market, on Grand Seiko as opposed to Core Seiko. The high end is the future of the brand in this market. In the United States of America, at least, according to uh, this article here, Grand Seiko does not view its customer base as uh, predominantly affordable watch buyers and collectors, the people like us, frankly. Uh, we're of very little value to them, apparently. So that article continues and it says, the changes in the US are part of a long-term Seiko group plan to become a power player in the lucrative luxury watch market. Hattori wants the company to compete aggressively for market share with Swiss brands in the global market, as it does in Japan. There, Grand Seiko is among the top five best-selling luxury watch brands. And again, this is focusing predominantly on Grand Seiko, and it's clear that that is the brand that they want to push. But as I get a little deeper into this, we're gonna be talking more about Core Seiko and Presage in particular. They're more affordable, kind of enthusiast watch uh, lineups and um, it's gonna sort of reinforce what I was saying in my previous video about Seiko, in that I think that even at that tier, in that price category, they're trying to push up market. 
Now this is an interesting point, and they start to really make clear that they feel like that affordable entry level is not a good spot for them to be in any longer. They say that uh, the changes are a response to the rapidly changing global watch marketplace, which Seiko executives acknowledge presents SWC with both opportunities and challenges. The challenges are primarily in the mid-price market, Seiko's traditional stronghold. Seiko sales in the U.S. have suffered in recent years due to market turmoil caused by e-commerce, smart watches, wearables, and the woes of brick-and-mortar retailers, particularly department stores. Um, yeah, they are in the affordable price range, saying that they're doing very poorly, at least in the United States. They don't... Um, Again, don't they don't want to be <laughs> in that market. They don't want to be supplying collectors and enthusiasts that are looking for high value, great, affordable, high quality watches with options anymore. But like, and we've seen it, and I've honed in on this in the previous video with the discontinuation of tons of really um, beloved watches like the Alpinist and the SARB033 and the 035 and, and many others that I'm not going to hit on here, but nevertheless, they're just discontinuing all of these beloved enthusiast watches that are extremely high value, high quality, affordable. Uh, they're just getting rid of all that stuff. And here they're just basically reiterating it, uh, proving my point, like I had mentioned in the previous video. More about Grand Seiko, and I mentioned uh, somebody here named uh, Lei... Trowadek. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Lay Trowadek. That is the new uh, president of Seiko USA. Uh, so he's going to be quoted here, just so you know who he is. Uh, so it says, uh, the new product and technology that's coming at the next Basel World will strengthen our brand in the higher price point. $7,000 and above is our target. In addition to Grand Seiko, GSA will distribute small upmarket collections of Seiko Presage mechanical watches and Prospects sports watches. Let me repeat that for you. Uh, in addition to Grand Seiko, GSA will also distribute small upmarket collections of Seiko Presage mechanical watches and Seiko Prospects sports watches. These so-called Seiko Presage lines will be priced in the affordable luxury range below Grand Seiko, but above core Seiko. Now, this is exactly what I was saying in that previous video when I said, is Seiko jumping the shark? And I made it very clear that I'm not happy with the direction that I have been seeing Seiko go. This basically just lays it out, confirms exactly what I thought they were doing 100% with Presage and Prospects. They're just raising the prices of those watches. They're moving them up market, just like they're doing with Grand Seiko. But... What they're not telling you here, and what I am have been telling you for a while, is while they're raising the prices, they are not increasing the quality of the products that they're offering. They're giving you the same thing that we used to be able to buy for about $300 to $325 in something like the SARB033, but now they're charging you $700 and $800 or more because they're calling it a limited edition. Anyway, it goes on to say that the strategy for these collections is to change the image of Seiko here as a discounted mass market brand. Uh, quote, we want to shift the image that consumers and retailers have to reflect what we really are, Leitredoc says. Namely, a full-fledged watch manufacturer that makes all of its watches, movements, and parts, mechanical and quartz, in-house, including hairsprings. Which they do. That's awesome. One of the reasons why enthusiasts like me love Seiko. Uh, but, it continues, Seiko began manufacturing timepieces in 1895. Uh, it produced its and Japan's first rich watch in 1903. Of course, they're talking about the Seiko uh, Laurel, if I'm not mistaken, which I uh, reviewed the homage, uh, the, the reissue or the recreation of that watch a while ago. Go check it in my, uh, in my library. The moral of the story, Seiko, even with its more affordable pieces, the Prospects and the Presage lineup watches, they want to move up market. They want to be perceived as, a, at a minimum, at least an affordable luxury brand, as they have stated here in this article. And I get it, I guess, but I don't agree with it. I don't like it. It makes me... Um, not feel more connected with the brand of Seiko. It makes me feel less connected or, or, or disconnected from Seiko. I feel like they've lost their way. And I said as much in that video a couple of months ago where I presented the question, has Seiko jumped the shark? 
Going on in the article, it says, uh, the time may be right for Grand Seiko in the US, but it appears to be up for the Seiko brand. That essentially was the assessment of a well-known American consulting company. Uh, SCA apparently declined to name the firm, but uh, SCA turned to the company in 2015 after years of eroding market share in the US. The study concluded that Seiko would never recover its once dominant position in the mid-market and recommended Seiko move up market. So Seiko apparently hired some uh, consulting firm to uh, study, I don't know, their their brand image, uh, their sales, who knows exactly what they studied, but they determined that uh, it's over for Seiko in the affordable entry level and probably even the mid-range. They basically, this company told Seiko, get out. And apparently that's what they're doing. They're following suit something that I started picking up on, and uh, something that uh, is apparently happening. The article does go on to say that in recent years, Seiko has been weakened by tough competition from citizen groups, mid-range brands, citizen and Bulova, and fashion brands. Sources say a management decision to cut back on advertising also damaged the brand. Uh, The turmoil in the mid market caused by the arrival of the Apple Watch and other wearables and the rise of e-commerce has aggravated Seiko's problems. Uh, When traffic declined in mass merchants and department stores and stores were shuttered, Seiko got hurt. Now, in 2017, Tokyo sent uh, Niato, a top SCA executive with experience in finance and legal matters, to the U.S. to head U.S. operations. His mandate was to cut Seiko's losses and begin to shift up market. Again, as we're seeing, like that's their whole goal here. Get out of the affordable and the mid-tier. Go up market. Now, he brought this uh, uh, Niato uh, executive, brought in the La Trodec uh, person, who, again, I had mentioned was the president of Seiko USA. Now, this is funny because I said this jokingly in... uh, in that video where I was talking about uh, did Seiko jump the shark and all of that, I said, like, with all of the limited edition watches that Seiko has been doing li- lately, like, what did they, like, hire staff from Omega? Is that where they got their cues from? And in fact, yes, that's true. L- <laughs> this guy, uh, Lee T- T- Trode- Tr- Trodek, however you say it, uh, was the head of Omega in the United States and uh, knows the luxury watch business here well, apparently. But uh, yeah, they in fact did just poach uh, poach whoever's in charge of Seiko USA now f- directly from Omega, and it makes perfect sense. Why are they doing all of these limited edition watches, just one after another and for absurd prices to boot, much like Omega does? Well, here we know that I was right. Yeah, they actually did just adopt the uh, Swatch slash Omega uh, mentality when it comes to uh, collectible watches, I guess. So that's basically, uh, I don't know, the hits, the high points of the article. It's a very long article. I'm not going to analyze every single word, phrase, paragraph, or sentence. It would take forever. But uh, yeah, I wanted to share some of that with you, the stuff that I found most interesting, and uh, basically just say, ha ha, I told you so. I was right all along. Seiko is, in fact, trying to get out of the mid-tier. They're trying to move up market, and um, those watches that we have known and loved, that were all discontinued, are just being discontinued because uh, Seiko doesn't want to sell cheap watches anymore, regardless of whether or not they're good. They want to sell expensive watches regardless of whether or not they're good. Pretty insane, I think. I am not a fan of the the business model that they are adopting. Am I still a fan of their watches? Well, yes and no. Uh, as a matter of fact, today I'm wearing my uh, SKX009. I don't know how well you can see that on camera. Um, I do like this watch. I wear it quite a bit. Will I buy another affordable Seiko watch, something in the core, presage, or prospects lineup? Absolutely not. I really don't think that I will. I have no plans to anyway. And why is that? Well, number one, because the prices are going up because they're trying to quote unquote move up market, uh, but they're not offering any more um, uh, value, features, specifications. They're not giving you more for the price. They're giving you the same stuff that we've seen in years gone by. They're just charging more for it. Uh, their quality control is abysmal. Honestly, it's got to be one of the worst big brands as far as quality controls. It's downright embarrassing. They should be embarrassed at how bad their quality control is at times when it comes to dive watches and uh, bezel alignments. 
uh, things on the dial being out of alignment, just everything. It's, it's ridiculous, to be perfectly honest. And I'm tired of having to spot check their quality control before I decide whether or not I'm going to keep a watch or send it back. I don't want to be the guy that has to send back every third watch he buys. That's annoying. So yeah, that's another reason why I'm just not buying from them. Poor value, poor quality control. Finally, their movements. The uh, 7S26, the 4R36, the 6R15. I have to say it, I think they're absolutely garbage movements. Yeah, you're going to get a lot of them that are going to be okay. They're going to keep decent enough time and... Uh, you know, it's the truth. I'm, I'm not saying that every single one is garbage, but the propensity to get a bad one is extremely high. I have had dozens and dozens of Seikos with 7S26s, some with 4R36s, and even a handful with 6R15 movements. And the percentage, I wish I had kept track, actually. I should have, but it didn't occur to me until it started happening so often that I noticed a trend, and it was too late, like I couldn't keep accurate records. But I mean, uh, there's got to be a third of them, maybe maybe more, have had some sort of problems with their timekeeping, either being outside of specifications right out of the box, or over time just getting worse and worse. Um, yeah, I hate their movements, I really do. The only good thing about them is that they're, or at least they were, affordable. You could get a 6R15 and a $300 SARB, for example, but that's not the case anymore. And they're easy to regulate. I can do it myself. That's about the only other good thing about them. But uh, yeah, in terms of their actual performance and reliability, it's absolutely garbage. <laughs> not, again, every single time, but the propensity is high enough to where I don't want to roll the dice on a Seiko movement anymore. I care a lot about accuracy and performance, and, uh, you know, while the 6R15 might be accurate within a range of minus 15 to plus 25, even if it were, quote-unquote, in spec at plus 25, that's not accurate enough for me personally, but oftentimes I'm going to find them to be outside of that range a little bit. And plus 30, even for a mechanical watch or an automatic watch, is too inaccurate for my tastes. I really prefer something to be within plus or minus 10, at a minimum. There you have it, guys. I think Seiko is making some mistakes. I think that they're probably doing well with Grand Seiko, and I should preference everything that I've said with I might still one day buy a Grand Seiko. I think that they're excellent watches. I think they are high-value watches. It's funny, though. I don't think they're going to be for long. I think they're going to be pushing the Grand Seiko line up market as well. I think in the years to come, the three and $4,000 Grand Seikos are going to disappear, and they're going to all be six and seven and $8,000 Grand Seikos. At that point, no, I'm not buying a Grand Seiko. But right now, I think that uh, it's a good time to buy a Grand Seiko. Get in while the prices are low, and you can get a high-quality, high-value watch. Keep an eye out for the rising prices, though. At least that's what I'm going to do. I'm really considering picking up one. As far as the more entry-level Seikos, the Seiko Core, the Seiko Prospects, and the Seiko Presage, I mean, first of all, the Core line is absolutely, all of it is pretty much garbage. Uh, if you go on the Seiko USA website and look at the Core line, it's all solar quartz watches, and I don't have anything with solar quartz watches in general. As a matter of fact, I kind of like them. However, the designs of the very, very vast majority of them are awful. None of them would I want to own uh, in terms of aesthetics. That leaves Prospects and, and Presage, and again, they're just, they're too expensive for what you get. They're moving the prices up, but they're not giving you anything extra for those prices. So yeah, I'm out. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. As always, I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm sure a ton of you are going to disagree with me. Tons of Seiko fanboys out there, and I probably, I was one for sure. I really did love Seiko. I still really do like all of those watches that I used to love. It's just that uh, they're all gone, basically. <laughs> so so anyway, I'm going to get a lot of hate for this one, I'm sure, but I bet a lot of people are going to agree with me, too. I'm looking forward to reading all the comments. So yeah, thanks for tuning in. I do appreciate it. Uh, as always, if you'd like to help support the channel, there's a number of ways that you can do that. They're always found in the description of this video and, of course, every video that I do. So click down there and try to help support me. Things you can do is to follow me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I would definitely appreciate that. Secondly, support on Patreon. Big thanks to the guys that have been supporting me on Patreon, but I could always use a little more help over there if you can afford to donate a couple of bucks a month. I would really appreciate it. Finally, my Amazon affiliate link. If you're thinking about buying anything that I've reviewed or anything else for that matter on Amazon, click my affiliate link first and I get a small commission. Those commissions do add up and a big thanks to everyone that has been using it. Well, that's going to wrap this one up for today. So until the next one, bye now.